any of you were sort of here last week, you remember that Paul began his speech by giving some uh, quotes from students over the years that he's taught. And it brought to mind a student of mine, actually from just before Christmas, handed in an essay. And the opening line of the essay was, historians like any other cult. Now, it was an interesting phrase to open an essay with, but to be fair, I can actually see his point. On occasion, it does feel like historians are a cult, and that we all group together around our particular beliefs and our ideology, and it's very hard to change those beliefs and ideologies. So really, what the aim of this paper, in one sense, is to sort of try and break down the idea that historians are a cult, uh, and give a bit more of a balanced view on biblical history. So um, that's one of the broad aims of the paper, and I shall come on to the more specific aims of the paper in just a minute. Right. In August 1821, Champollion, the scholar who would eventually become famous for being the first person to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphs, was distracted from his studies by the arrival in France of the Dendera Zodiac. And there's the man himself. This zodiac was a sculpture portraying a circular diagram of astrological symbols and signs and the constellations. And it formed part of the ceiling of a room in the Temple of Hathor. And this was at Dendera, which was about 300 miles south of Cairo. Having first been recorded during Napoleon's ill-fated expedition to Egypt, the zodiac had remained a focus of controversy because of various scholars who were claiming that it could prove the age of uh, the Bible. Reproductions of the zodiac were studied by a series of prestigious scholars who hoped that if they carefully studied the positions of the stars which were depicted, it would be possible to work out their actual positions at the time when the zodiac was created. If this were the case, then calculating the dates when the stars were in these positions would provide clues as to the time frame when it was produced. Right, so I've got a picture of this. And that's the actual um, zodiac itself. Uh, not particularly clear, so I've given you a, a drawing of it. And all of these are different zodiacs and different constellations. Scholars, having used this methodology, immediately began to argue amongst themselves as to whose dates were correct. The academic opposition, however, paled into insignificance against the, the protests of the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church watched on with interest, as essentially what these men were disputing was, it, it was nothing less than the date for the creation of the world. On one side of the bait stood scholars such as Yomad, who were bold enough to suggest that the Dendera Zodiac was many thousands of years old, perhaps as many as 15,000. This hypothesis stood in direct opposition to the accepted Christian belief, which deduced that the world was no older than 6,000 years. And it wasn't until the end of 1822 that Sampolian had made enough advances in hieroglyphs that he was able to finally end the controversy. In the end, he concluded that the sculpture was far more recent than scholars had suggested, ultimately concluding the zodiac dated to the Greek or Roman period. Although this particular stumbling block had been overcome, the French scholars had unwittingly linked the study of Egypt with the search to prove biblical accuracy. And thus, from this time onwards, Egyptology has been regarded as a window opening onto the biblical landscape. As a consequence, biblical scholars looked to Egypt and its abundance of texts to gain a clearer picture of contemporary events in Israel. Therefore, in 1837, you find Pope Gregory XVI founding an, Egy an Egyptian museum in the Vatican, and he felt that if Catholics were aware of Egyptian history, they would increase their understanding of the Bible. In 1882, the British founded the Egyptian Exploration Fund, which still continues to this day, though under the changed name of the Egyptian Exploration Society, and one of whose main aims was to find archaeological evidence to prove the Bible. As a result of these various archaeological attempts, uh, these various archaeological inquests, today's received wisdom attempts to cite the sojourn of the Israelites and the patriarch of Joseph in the 18th dynasty, which is roughly 1500 to 1200 BC, whilst Moses and the Exodus are placed in the 19th dynasty, which is around 1300 to about 11,000 BC. This neat, uh, sorry, this neat chronological scheme has many supporters. These are amongst the academic community, theologians, and amongst the general public. In recent years, however, scepticism has arisen regarding the accuracy of Genesis, Exodus, and Joshua, while some scholars even suggest that later books such as Judges, Samuel, and early sections of Kings and Chronicles can no longer be trusted. Some scholars, even the occasional theologian, would prefer to treat the early books of the Bible as fiction. This is in, this is in part because their view that the books were written at a much later date by post-exile editors 
who had imprecise knowledge of the events they were describing. One of the leading authorities of all things biblical who subscribed to this theory was Professor Thomas L. Thompson of Copenhagen University. He published a book entitled The Early Histories of the Israelite People from the Written and Archaeological Record. And in this book he suggested that the Old Testament was a series of fictional stories written in the 2nd century BC. He therefore concluded that it would be a complete waste of time to try and prove the Bible through archaeology. And this is an approach he still stands by. His approach was popular and became known as the Copenhagen School of Exegesis. His conclusions were lent further support as there was a distinct lack of archaeological evidence to support any of the major events depicted in the Bible. However, as I will demonstrate in just a minute, this was not because the evidence didn't exist, but merely that historians and archaeologists were looking for it at the wrong time frame. Clearly at this moment, a philosophical divide had opened up between those who would accept the biblical narrative and those who would entirely dismiss it in a, and it's more, as moralistic fiction. The polarisation of these two positions rapidly became an issue of blind faith versus scientific fact, with little room for a compromise. This stalemate continued until 1994 when David Roll, a PhD student at UCL in London, published a revised chronology for Egypt. This revised chronology sent shockwaves through the academic com community. Although I don't really want to get bogged down today in complexities of different chronologies, I feel it's necessary to briefly outline my own position and why I feel it's the most accurate. As I've already stated, the chronology used in this paper differs substantially from all of those published previous to David Roll. Let me explain. Whereas we have a series of absolute dates from 763 BC onwards, and especially after the birth of Christ, from which we can accurately date many of the key historical events, previous, previous to these dates, historians and archaeologists have to turn detective in order to determine a chronology. So how, about, how do historians go about creating this pre-absolute date chronology? In answer, we must examine the way in which the ancient Egyptians recorded their own chronology. The Egyptians used a system of dating that assigned key events a date that corresponded to a specific year of a particular monarch's reign. Therefore, we know that the Battle of Kadesh took place in the fifth year of the reign of Ramesses the Great. But how do we assign the absolute date of 1275 BC? Well, to put it crudely, historians simply add up the reigning years of all the Egyptian rulers and work backwards from the time of Christ. Um, and this has led scholars to believe that the Bible could not be considered as a historical source on account of none of the dates in the Bible actually corresponding with the dates worked out from the Egyptian king lists. However, as you've probably all worked out, this system relies heavily on the accuracy of the Egyptian king lists and, in particular, our understanding of them. Now, already various scholars have interpreted the Egyptian king list in different ways, and it's here that the, the conventional chronology falls down. What David Roll and his successor um, James has done is to point out the inaccuracies in these timelines and propose a redating of many of the key events. In both men's work, this has brought the Egyptian chronology with, in line with those dates presented in the Bible. And thus, my, my paper tonight really has three main aims. The first is to investigate the historical accuracy of the Old Testament through an examination of the literary evidence for some of the key events. So what other um, literary texts do we have which support the biblical narrative? My second aim is to use archaeological evidence from a variety of ancient cultures to examine the validity of the new chronologies for Egypt and Israel. And finally, I want to, I want to utilise new methods of research, such as astrological dating, to more fully explore the viability of such a radical change in the conventional dating system. So to begin with then, why do we need this new chronology? What's prompted this change? Well, the first reason we need the new chronology is that recent research has suggested that the Egyptian 21st and 22nd dynasties reign concurrently rather than in succession. The conventional chronology, therefore, pushed earlier Egyptian dynasties back in time by up to 300 years, and this makes it, in my opinion, substantially wrong. With Egyptian records being used to date the biblical events and history in general, the dates given by biblical historians and archaeologists must therefore be substantially revised. It is interesting to note that one of the main criticisms of the Old Testament is that the date it, dates it provides are over 200 years out. However, under the new chronology, the dates provided by the Bible correspond almost completely with the revised series of events. Right, secondly, radiocarbon dating from Egyptian excavations are seldom quoted. This is because they are considered to be suspect as they contradict the conventional chronology. 
Radiocarbon dating is a process that determines the decay rate of carbon elements in a particular substance and is normally considered to be the most precise form of dating. However, the results of the carbon dating for Egyptian artefacts tend to disprove the conventional chronology and thus they become ignored. Interestingly, however, these carbon dates do correspond exactly to the new chronology. Thirdly then, during the 19th century it was discovered that Egyptian dynastic sequences could be anchored in time by a papyrus document recording the helical rising of the star Sirius. This document was to form the foundation of the conventional chronology and became known as the Sothic dating system. However, the calculations under the Sothic system assumed an unchanging calendar and we now know that the Egyptians had to frequently make adjust adjustments to their calendar in order to make it work. A papyrus record of lunar observations that had been used to support the Sosic system has been redated and now points towards the new chronology. The new chronology is further supported by findings of a number of astrophysicists. These astrophysicists have recalculated lunar eclipse dates according to a newly discovered shift in the Earth's axis of rotation. Now I'm not really a scientist so I can't really answer questions on what the actual evidence for this is but there's a lot of mathematical equations which one of my colleagues when I was working in Cardiff went at great length to explain to me and it did just go straight over my head. Um, so if you do have any questions she's always said that she's quite willing for people to email her but I'm not really an expert on, on the maths of this. So then for example a, a solar eclipse recorded in Phoenicia during the 12th year of Akhenaten's reign can now be definitively calculated by computer to have been in 1012 BC. This revised date now plays Akhenaten's reign in the 11th century, whereas previously it's been considered in the 14th century. And this again offers some startling evidence to support the new chronology. Uh, again, there's a nice little computer program that you can now download off the internet called Redshift, and you can put in the uh, eclipse dates for all the, the biblical eclipses, and it will show you a three-dimensional model of where these eclipses would be viewed from and things like that. Um, so if you, if you want to sort of have a bit more of a visual on this, I suggest you, you go onto the internet. Further astrological evidence to, um, also adds credence to the new dating system. An observation of Venus in Babylonia during the reign of Amisaduga, successor of the famous king Hammurabi, became important for the dating of Babylonian history. However, his reign has now been calculated by computer to have occurred in the 16th century BC, whereas previously it had been the 18th century. This means that we must also push back Hammurabi's reign to by about 200 years. And finally, the star alignment of the Giza pyramids are now dated to approximately 2400 BC rather than, con rather than the conventional date of 2600. So our third reason is that the Sothic dating system is now outdated. Finally, the Amarna letters dating to the reign of Akhenaten record the conflict between the Hebrew leader Lebea and a group of Canaanite cities. Lebea's career is remarkably similar to that of King Saul described in the Bible. And it, in, it is interesting that the word Lebea actually means Lion of Yah, Lion of God. Conventional chronology places these letters in the 14th century BC, which in archaeological terms makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. We can, we can read from these um, letters that there are a number of events going on, and the archaeology just says these events can't be happening at this time frame. There is no archaeological evidence to prove them at all. Um, however, under the new chronology, these letters are placed in the 11th century BC, and as I'll go on to explain in greater detail later, this makes far greater sense. And this actually places Lebea in the right time for him to be Saul. And this again, as I said, makes a, a lot more historical sense. So the fourth, fourth reason I think we need a new chronology is the Amarna letters, and this is a, a vital piece of evidence. Right. So having identified some of the main reasons why the chronology needs revision, I'll now move on to examine how this new chronology can directly affect the perception we have for the historical accuracy of the Old Testament. And I want to begin with uh, Joseph, or Joseph Vizier of Egypt, or as you guys probably know, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this image of Joseph um, from my personal collection of Jason Donovan memorabilia. Um, but what I want you to do is forget that image and actually focus on that image because as you'll come to see in a minute, that is the face of Joseph. Right, so as I said, I shall begin by exploring the life and times of Joseph, son of Jacob. Probably better known to you, as I said, as Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. 
The biography of Joseph is perhaps the, the richest and most detailed uh, that we have in the entire Old Testament. So what evidence do we have for this legendary overseer of Egypt? And how does the new chronology affect his position in history? Well, unfortunately for us and probably for Joseph, unlike the Bible, history has chosen to almost forget him. And until, until recently, archaeological evidence for his existence has been sparse and hotly debated. The new chronology, however, offers some tantalising pieces of evidence that have enabled historians to more confidently place Joseph in his rightful historical context. The first effect of the new chronology um, was to change the pharaoh who promoted Joseph to vizier. Now, secular historians prior to David Roll have subscribed and who have subscribed to the conventional dating system claim Joseph served in Egypt during the turbulent years of the invading Hiskos dynasty. Proponents of this view argue that Hiskos king is far more likely to have installed a Semite like Joseph into a position of fundamental power rather than an Egyptian pharaoh who would see this as a sign of weakness. However, Christian followers of the conventional chronology placed Joseph during the reign of Amenemhat II, uh, and neither group of scholars were able to produce any tangible evidence to support this placing. Thus, they found little archaeological evidence to back up their claims, and again, you go to a conference and you'll find them, rather than actually resorting to the evidence, resorting to personal insults. Um, it's quite, quite entertaining to watch on occasion. The new chronology, on the other hand, locates Joseph during the reign of Eminem III, and this moves his reign to about 147 years later than traditionally um, given. And this immediately uh, presents some really startling information. Um, Amenemhat III was the most powerful pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom and has been calculated as reigning for 47 years. According to the history of Genesis, Joseph was appointed, uh, Joseph's appointment was marked by seven years, of uh, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of disastrous famine. The Israelites arrived and settled in Egypt during the second year of hardship. So, can we find any archaeological evidence to support either the years of plenty and famine, or to find the Israelites in Egypt? Um, well, the, re the answer is a resounding yes. Under the new chronology, we have a remarkable amount of evidence dating to the time frame, and which demonstrates that there was a time of plenty followed by a severe famine. And this, in turn, um, seems to have caused a significant um, settlement of foreigners, including Israelites, in Egypt. So how can archaeology tell us all this? Well, in 1844, a German Egyptologist, Karl Lepsus, discovered in the narrow Smyrna Gorge a series of records for the flood levels dating to the 12th and early 13th dynasties. From this information, it was possible to piece together that from the third year of Amenemhat III's reign until the year of the 13th dynasty, the floods of the Nile were exceptionally high, averaging a peak height between 16 and 18 metres. However, during the 20th year of his reign, the peak flood increased greatly to around 21 metres. And the, these uh, exceptionally high, sort of 21 metres and above flood levels were to continue for around seven to eight years. An American hydrologist, Barbara Bell, has calculated that the amount of water flowing into Egypt during the 12 peak years would have been four times greater than the quantity produced in a typical flood. The consequences would have been dramatic and devastating. The floodwaters would have continued to have drowned the land well into December, preventing the planting of crops and hence causing a shortage in grain and barley. To add further credence to this hypothesis, we, can't, we find the pharaoh, during his reign, beginning major hydraulic works in order to cut back on excessive flood levels. The result of the high but not exceptionally high floods was that more land could be cultivated. As the Nile flooded out, it, it brought um, silt and nutrients to the land, and as it receded, the, the Egyptian farmers would plant their crops. So if you had a really high flood level, um, high enough that it, it, it would flood greater amounts of land, but not so high that it would recede in time for you to plant. You could actually produce three times as much as you would in an average year. Right, so as well as evidence for the years of prosperity and famine, we also have a startling find of cursed tablets which record the name Jacob, and which is more than likely to be the biblical Jacob. Um, the more startling discovery is also of the non-Egyptian name of Joseph itself. So why is this a startling discovery? Well, cursed tablets were small clay figurines or pieces of pottery which were destroyed in order to activate a negative spell against one's enemies. 
Uh, in the exceptional case that we have here, the Egyptian state had all the rulers of um, the Egyptian provinces listed on separate dolls and smashed. The intention in being was to unite the power of the provincial governors and destroy an external enemy. Unfortunately, we're not sure what the external enemy was, but it was quite a drastic action to take at this point. Um, however, amongst these curse tablets are the name of Jacob and Joseph, who are ascribed to towns in Palestine. Although previous scholars have recognised instantly that these were the biblical names of Jacob and Joseph, they were prevented from making a more direct connection simply because the chronology was out of sync. Even if this name has no verifiable connection with the biblical Joseph, it is still an indication that the Israelite mo had moved into Egypt and that it was occurring far, uh, substantially earlier than the conventional chronology suggests. Further evidence was discovered by Austrian archaeologists working at a dig site in Tel Eddaba, just outside the ancient city of Avaris. They uncovered a large Egyptian-style palace which was attached to an ornamental garden. At the lowest archaeological levels of this palace, it was discovered that there were a much smaller villa which was of Syrian, not Egyptian origin. The tombs located in the garden contained Asiatic grave goods confirming that the occupants were not themselves Egyptian. The original Syrian villa has been dated to the late 12th century, which under the new chronology is exactly the time when Jacob was arriving in Egypt. And it is likely that sometime following the death of his father Jacob, Joseph built the much grander palace and relocated his official residence to his family home. And this is what the uh, archaeological evidence suggests. Although I haven't tonight got time to fully analyse the archaeology of this palace, there is one dramatic piece of evidence that supports the hypothesis. This evidence can be found within the tomb complex of the palace. In Exodus 13, verse 19, it is stated that Moses took the bones of Joseph with him when the Israelites departed from Avaris. So, if archaeologists were going to find the tomb of Joseph, it needed to display four main characteristics. Firstly, if the tomb was found in its, uh, intact in its archaeological context, then there should be clear evidence that the body had been removed in ancient times. But more importantly, this should be done without the grave goods having been plundered, something which we can normally identify by signs of vandalism. Secondly, the tomb is likely to have characteristics of an Egyptian tomb, given that Joseph's status um, was vizier, one of the highest ranks in Egyptian society. Thirdly, we should also expect, expect to find indications of Joseph's Asiatic origins, not purely Egyptian. And finally, Given his high status within the Egyptian hierarchy, the tomb is likely to be monumental and of a significant standing. In the spring of 1987, archaeologists began to uncover a very large tomb situated in the southernmost part of the palace gardens. The foundations of the superstructure measured 12 metres by 7, which is a considerable size and fulfils the fourth point on my list of prerequisites. From the base you could work out that there was a, a pyramid structure on top, and that's uh, E. C is the entrance, uh, B is uh, the uh, uh, first floor, and then you go down to where the actual sarcophagi is, which is um, A. And the bottom one is just sort of looking top down. So the fact that the monument indicates that a mini pyramid had been constructed on the site again suggests that we were looking at the tomb of Joseph. As the archaeologists entered the tomb, they noticed that unlike every other tomb in the cemetery, this one was completely clear of debris and there was none of the usual signs of grave robbers which accompanied a looted tomb. Instead, the tomb seems to have been systematically cleared with care and precision, which would seem to suggest that point one on my uh, list had been fulfilled. Um, theoretically, this opening could have taken place just prior to the mass departure of the Israelites from Avaris. Once the archaeologists have actually excavated to the back of the tomb, they were to make a more startling discovery in the unearthing of the cult statue of, uh, of the original occupant. The cult statue depicts a man of Asiatic origin who, unlike his Israelite contemporaries, is depicted as clean-shaven, uh, more in the manner of Egyptian. Across the right breast of the statue, the man holds his insignia of office, the Egyptian throw stick, an item which is also used to denote foreigners. Um, so, so far, the imagery all suggests that this man um, was a foreigner, foreigner who was integrated into the hierarchy of the Egyptians at a high level. However, there was one final feature which, above all others, identifies this Asiatic man as Joseph. Wrapped around the body of this official, enveloping all but his head, neck, arms and feet, is a wondrous coat of many colours. And there we have it.
Now, to us today who are used to having multicolored fabrics, um, and you just go into a shop and you can buy a fabric which has got, say, eight or nine different colors, this may not look particularly impressive. But if this is an actual representation of the, the coat itself, um, this is a, a remarkable piece of uh, clothing. If you notice between the actual sort of colours, it looks like a brick pattern. That's actually gold inlay, so it's likely that this was held together by gold thread. Um, and one of the other ways of interpreting the coat, we, we, we interpret it most often as many coloured, but it can also be many tasseled. Um, and this coat would have had a number of tassels on it, so it fulfils both interpretations. So, the rich reds and blues are trimmed with gold, black and white to produce a simple but effective geometric pattern of stripes and rectangles. The garment is similar to the coat worn by the Midianites arriving in Egypt recorded in the tomb of Khnum Hotep, which we've got here. Um, these are a more simplistic version of the coat that Joseph's wearing. So, as I've hopefully begun to demonstrate, the account of Joseph's life recorded in the Bible is remarkably accurate with archaeology now being able to confirm many of the extraordinary events and occurrences previously thought as fictional. So what I want to move on to look at now is the um, Israelite oppression in Egypt. And so I now turn to the most controversial aspect of this paper, and any paper attempting to look at the chronology of the Bible, the Israelites' time in Egypt and the Exodus. Um, there are still scholars today who suggest that the Israelites were never in Egypt, and that the... Um, the whole story itself is fabrication, and uh, literally this, this journal has come out uh, in January. Um, it's actually qu quite a good journal. Um, but it, it feels necessary to defend the idea that the Israelites were present in Egypt. Um, and it presents some good evidence to, to prove that. Um, so, what evidence is there for the um, Israelites in Egypt? Well, there's tons of it, and I don't really want to go into too much of it. But on a basic level, here we have a group of um, Asiatic slaves depicted working in different farming contexts. Um, so one of the things the Bible says is the Israelites were put to work on the land. This would seem to back that up. And the second one is the one that m most people have heard of, the Israelites being put to work brick making. Here's a clear example of that. Um, so there's no end of evidence to support the idea that, Israelites, that the Israelites were in Egypt. So... Um, people that dispute that are basically clutching at straws. So two radically different dates have been proposed for the Exodus. The first date is given by the Bible of around 1447 BC and which is generally followed by Christian scholars, whilst the other is somewhere between 1279 to 1213 BC and which is promoted by secular advocators of the conventional chronology. The main reason for the dispute is the fact that there is a considerable amount of confusion regarding which pharaoh was reigning during the time of the Exodus. <coughs> Secular historians have concluded that Ramesses II was pharaoh of Egypt and it was his reign that the Israelites were forced to flee. Um, so we reach the, the previous historians have reached this conclusion from a number of flawed premises. Firstly, the Victorians who have been, began the study of Egyptology were from a Judeo-Christian culture and they were intrinsically drawn towards providing uh, evidence to prove the biblical accuracy of the Old, Test uh, to prove the, uh, accuracy of the Old Testament at all costs. With Champollion's first decipher decipherment of hieroglyphs, it was instantly obvious that one pharaoh dominated all others and this was Ramesses II, otherwise known as Ramesses the Great. He was recognised as having built a large number of cities and temples in the Delta region but significantly he founded a new capital called Piramses. Ramesses is also um, renowned for going into someone else's temple and carving his name on it. So not content with just building his own temples and, and monuments, if someone else has left the monument that he could find space to carve his name, he does so. Uh, so this has further confused historians who just think that everything in Egypt was at one point or another built by Ramesses. Right, so if we, we couple this idea that he found, founds the city of Pyramuses with the evidence found in the first chapter of Exodus, where it's stated that the Israelites were forced to build the store cities of Pithom and Ramses, and thus it's easy to see why early scholars thought it was Ramesses II who enslaved the Israelites. 
However, there is a significant amount of other historical evidence presented in the Bible which undermines such a simplistic link. For example, according to 1 Kings 6 verses 1 to 2, the exodus from Egypt took place 480 years prior to the construction of the first temple of Jerusalem. We know that the building of the first temple was begun in the fourth year of Solomon's rule, but unfortunately we're still in confusion as to when Solomon actually reigned. Although Victorian scholars thought that Solomon reigned in the late 11th century, it's now generally recognised that Solomon began his reign in around 971 BC. So under the new chronology, this would place the Exodus securely in the middle of the 15th century, i.e. around 1447. 19th century Egyptologists had already worked out that Ramesses II's reign dated to 1279 BC, so there's a clear discrepancy between the biblical dates for the construction of the store city of Ramses and the Egyptian date for the building of Pi Ramses. Furthermore, even if it could be argued that Ramesses II was the great pharaoh of the oppression, and the Israelites did build his new capital, Pi Ramses, we would not then expect to find an earlier reference in the Old Testament to a location called Ramses. There were, after all, no pharaohs called Ramesses before Ramesses II's grandfather, and hence, as Egyptian royal cities were named after their founder, the cities of Ramses must have been built by one of the Ramesses. But in Genesis 47.11, it's clearly stated that Joseph had settled his father and brothers at the orders of Pharaoh in the upper part of Egypt, the region known as Ramses. So then, according to the Bible, the Israelites settled in the region of Ramses centuries before the first Pharaoh called Ramesses. So how is this possible? <coughs> well, to get around this, it was argued by biblical scholars, both secular and historian, uh, Christian, that the term had been used anachronistically i.e. it had been edited into the text in order to identify the area of the Eastern Delta to the contemporary readership. Uh, and David Rolls has, has taken this and he said, if the reign of Ramesses in Genesis 47.11 was, uh, was an anachronism, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, an anachronism, then it is not implausible to suggest that the cities of Ramesses in Exodus 1.11 is also used in a similar manner. Well, let me give you a bit more of a modern day example of this. It would be like opening your encyclopedia and reading that the Romans crossed the Litus Saxonicum in order to evade Britannia, which when they arrived, they constructed a fortified town at Eboricum. Probably this entry doesn't really make much sense to most of you. Uh, it's not really clear to the modern reader what's going on. So the, the entry itself would more than likely read the Romans crossed the English Channel in order to evade Britain. When they landed, they constructed a fortified position in York. This anachronistic use of names gives a modern reader a clear idea of what events are happening and it also shows you where the events are happening and it puts it into perspective. This would appear to be the same process employed by the editors of the Old Testament. For example, it's entirely possible that the Israelites built an earlier city at the same site, which by the 6th century was hidden under the ruins of Pyramses, a hypothesis which recent excavations suggest is correct. The final nail, though, in the coffin for scholars who suggest that the Exodus occurred sometime during the 1279 to 1213 period is a passage from the book of Judges. In Judges 11.26, the Israelite judge Jephthah, who reigned in around 11.20, is negotiating with the king of the Ammonites. In this passage, he refers back to the time when the Israelites first settled in Hebron, just prior to the invasion of the Promised Land, approximately 40 years after the Exodus. Jephthah gives the interval between the settlement and present day as around 300 years. Add to this the 40 years of wandering and we arrive at an exodus date of around 1416, uh, 1460, which offers far more support to the date of 1447 than it does to a later one. Unable to reasonably explain this discrepancy, biblical historians pushing for a later date have ignored the evidence. Although Christian scholars using the conventional chronology had the correct date of 1447, their work was equally inaccurate as they, were to, as they were ascribing the exodus to the wrong pharaoh. This time the unfortunate man was Amenhotep II. So we've now got two bad guys, Ramesses and Amenhotep II. With no um, archaeological evidence to, or literary evidence to pr prove their argument, they were equally in the dark. And once again you get scholarly disagreement. Um, which is sometimes friendly, sometimes not. However, the shuffling of the pharaohs under the new chronology has offered an alternative history of the Exodus. 
a history that provides conclusive answers to many of these problematic questions and which is supported by a wide range of evidence. One of the first controversies that surround this period of biblical history is the, is the length of the Israelite sojourn. In the Hebrew text, it is stated in the book, um, book of Exodus 12, 40 to 41, that the sojourn, either from the time of Jacob's arrival in Egypt until Moses' departure, was 430 years. However, it appears that a crucial element for our understanding of the chronology has been omitted from this text. In the Greek and Samaritan scriptures, it is suggested that the 430-year sojourn started with the departure from Abraham from northern Mesopotamia, not actually Jacob's arrival in Egypt, and it ended with Moses' departure for the Promised Land. Various passages in the book of Genesis enable us to ca calculate that the era from Abraham's arrival in Canaan to Jacob's arrival um, in Egypt was 215 years, thus a further 215 years for the exile in Egypt. So we can again squeeze out a significant amount of time from the conventional chronology. So how does this shortening then of the sojourn and the shifting of the pharaohs under the new chronology affect the exodus? And what evidence is there to support the dates that I'm suggesting? Well, after the death of Joseph in around 1617 BC, the political cohesion of Egypt um, started to disintegrate. Over the next 100 years or so, Egypt was to go through a series of civil wars and social revolutions. And this was to bring an unsettling effect to the whole region. During these turbulent years, the relationship between the Israelites and the Egyptians was to be severely stra strained, with the eventual outcome that the Egyptians enslaved the Israelite population as it's the easiest way to su uh, subdue them. Anthropological studies of the skeletal remains from Avaris, which date to the right time frame under the new chronology for the Israelite oppression in Egypt, demonstrate that the Israelite population developed serious health problems associated with poverty and malnourishment. Parasitic diseases such as anemia affected at least one third of the population, whilst Harris lines in the lung bones indicated that growth was stunted. Life expectancy dropped to around 32 years, roughly 29.7 years for women and 34.4 for men. And hence the archeological evidence seems to suggest that the um, Israelites were being oppressed at this period. Under the new chronology, it was during the, reign, the early years of Sobek Hotep IV's reign that the infamous decree went out to cull all the male infants of the expanding Israelite community. By only terminating the male children, the Egyptians guaranteed themselves a female population who could continue with domestic work and who could work on a large number of labour-intensive agricultural sites. But this also meant that they could eliminate potential troublemakers. Again, the archaeological evidence provides chilling evidence for this massacre. Throughout the excavation sites, the graves of these infant victims have been uncovered. The normal number of infant graves unearthed in ancient settlements is roughly around 25%, but here the figure reached a staggering 65%. Further supporting evidence can be found in the excavated graves of the later adult population. In the subsequent period, archaeologists have found that there is a ratio of five females to every three males, and this again seems to confirm the biblical narrative. It was into this turbulent situation that Moses was to be born. Although I haven't got time to examine the whole of Moses' life and many, many events leading up to the Exodus, I do want to briefly examine the most symbolically significant, the death of the firstborn. This event is recorded in Exodus 12, 29 to 30, where it is stated, At midnight, God struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh, heir to his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon and the firstborn of all livestock. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up in the night and there was great, great wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without dead. The Bible tells us that, all, that this awesome event was the catalyst behind the Pharaoh releasing the Israelites from their bondage. So are we dealing with a sudden overnight catastrophe as Exodus depicts? Or is this an event that took place over a much longer period of time? For example, if there was a plague or a disease, the effect could be as devastating as what we discover, but it would take a much longer time to manifest itself. Either way, a look at the archaeology can, can prove an answer. So, with our, with our redating of the Exodus, we must look towards the 13th dynasty sites to provide the answer. 
Sadly, the only major site that thus far has been excavated is a virus itself, but is there any evidence here to support the idea? Well, the answer, um, as you've probably guessed already, is a qualified yes. All over the city, at um, the archaeological level for the 13th, dinner, uh, 13th century, we find burial pits in, to which the victims of some terrible disaster had been thrown. This was not careful interment of the deceased, as the bodies were not arranged and no grave goods were provided, and the burial seemed to have been done in haste. Now, one of the first things people know about Egypt is the idea of the tombs, of the pharaohs and the pyramids. The Egyptians were very careful with their burial. Um, in order to enter the afterlife, certain conditions had to be met, um, certain traditions and um, certain rituals had to be carried out. None of those have been carried out on these dead. So what seems to be going on is that there's a, a vast number of people dying which has um, prevented the actual rituals from being taken and carried out. And you just get heaps of bodies in one pit. So what I would interpret this evidence as is the um, death of the firstborn. Right, I shall now move on to briefly examine the Exodus itself. Okay. Um, the Exodus is perhaps the hardest biblical account to prove archaeolog uh, archaeologically. Surveys of the desert have failed to produce any clear signs that the Israelites have passed through. We have no evidence for large-scale camps, and many scholars have suggested this is because the account is actually fictitious. It is true, little pottery has been found, but this is to be expected, as in order to manufacture ceramic vessels, you require water, soil, kilns, and clay. A nomadic population simply does not have the facilities for such things. Another reason that we have so little evidence for the years of wandering is the very fact that they were spent wandering. The Oxford Encyclopedia of Archaeology makes it clear that even today, nomadic settlements once vacated are almost impossible to identify. Despite the invisibility of archaeological surveys of Sinai have produced over 300 sites in the Middle Bronze Age, the exact time under which the new chronology suggests the Exodus should be occurring. This is more than in any other time frame, time frame proposed for the Exodus, and offers um, admittedly speculative evidence that the dates under the new chronology are nearer to the truth. As well as the archaeological material, we can also be confident of the new dates on account of the work undertaken by an American astrophysicist, Wayne Mitchell. Who, ha who, as I suggested earlier, has managed using ancient observations of the planet Venus to pinpoint the, the first year of the reign of the Babylonian king Amusagdugar. Using this definitive pinpoint, Mitchell was able to identify the extremely rare double eclipse of February 25th and March 12th, 1362. This in turn helped to offer other definitive dates for key events in Babylonian history. Having completed his cross-cultural analysis, Mitchell tested his finds on the chronology of Egypt and Israel and discovered that it fitted almost perfectly with the archaeological picture being developed by David Roll. There is a large volume of evidence from a variety of cultures that support this redating from the Babylonian star charts. There is in fact so much evidence that it's impractical for me to detail it here, but if anyone's interested I can email them the, the evidence um, afterwards. Right, so I shall now move on to look at Joshua and Jericho. With the death of Moses, one of the most highly respected generals, Joshua was to take command over the Israelite people. The story of Joshua's destruction of Jericho remains one of the most powerful biblical legends, yet archaeologists investigating the site have produced no firm evidence to confirm that a city even existed at the end of the Late Bronze Age, as would be required under the conventional chronology. The conventional chronology places the arrival of the Israelites in Canaan at the very end of the Bronze Age on the basis that Ramesses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus, a myth that I've already dispelled. On account of this fact, it was expected that the destruction of the Israelite conquest would be revealed where such sites as Jericho were um, excavated. However, as various archaeological digs were undertaken, it became clear that none of the cities which the Bible claimed were captured or burnt by Joshua were done during this time frame, and most continued to flourish without signs of violent assault. As a result, Joseph's conquest was written off as just another biblical myth. If there was no Jericho for the Israelites to destroy, then it was reasoned that perhaps there was no Joshua either. Some scholars went as far as to suggest that there was no invasion, and concluded that the Israelites were merely part of the indigenous population. The biblical narrative that con contradicted this evolutionary view was simply ignored. 
Under the new chronology, however, the conquest of Canaan would now be dated to the last phases of the Middle Bronze Age. And if we examine the archaeological record for this time frame, we discover that all the cities that Joshua allegedly stormed were indeed in ruin. Joshua's invasion of the Promised Land did not take place at the end of the Bronze Age, as has previously been believed, but instead took place in the Middle Bronze Age, and this can be proved unambiguously through archaeology. Under the new chronology, all of the cities littered in the Joshua narrative was being destroyed were in ruins, whereas six out of the 16 can be identified in the conventional chronology. So, having conquered Jericho, Joshua was faced with pacifying the surrounding <coughs> regions. The elders of the town of Gibeon sent a peace delegation to Joshua and offered him unconditional surrender if he would accept them as his allies. Joshua agreed to the petition and also consented to leave the city unharmed. However, the rulers of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish and Eglon formed the coalition and besieged Gibeon. Joshua found himself in an impossible situation. He was now obligated by oath to protect his new allies and he had to send a relieving army and join battle. And this he did on the 13th of July, 1406. Having defeated the coalition army in pitched battle, Joshua was forced to watch as a large number of the enemy fled back towards their fortified cities. Joshua knew that if this route was to be allowed and was to proceed unchecked, he would have to lay siege to all of the five cities, something he simply couldn't afford to do. He therefore faced a serious problem. All, already over half the day was gone, and it would be impossible for him to destroy the fleeing troops at night. The Bible therefore tells us that he shouts out to God, begging him to stop the progress of the sun, and thus give him the light that he needed to totally destroy his enemy. God is recorded as answering his prayers, and Joshua was able to use the extended daylight hours to wipe out his foes. So, is there any evidence to substantiate this biblical story? And again, as you've probably already guessed, yes, there is. Firstly, we've got the Greek historian Herodotus, who's fairly close to my heart. He tells us that he saw the records in Egypt which detailed an exceptionally long day. Secondly, there are six independent accounts which record in their histories an exceptionally long day at the same time as Joshua's. The most clear is the Indian Hindu account, which says, and I quote, In the life of Krishnu, the sun delayed setting in order to hear the pious ejaculations of Akron. This delay that was recorded was 12 hours, and the date of this mysterious long day, well, around 1400 BC. And this would seem to correspond precisely with that of Joshua's. Professor Totten and Mulder, have, um, both astrophysicists, have examined the astrological <coughs> events described in the Bible and they provide the next piece of evidence. Both men concluded that Joshua's location at the time of the event, i.e. the Valley of Edgelon, was the only place where the biblical description of the position of the sun and moon would have hold true. They also concluded that the only date when this would be possible would be roughly July 1400 BC, and this would thus seem to confirm the biblical accounts. At the start of the winter of 1405, having subdued these foes, Joshua called a great assembly at Shechem. Uh, and he did this in the compound where Abraham had rested under an oak tree and where Isaac had built a shrine. Here Joshua erected a large white limestone slab of rock, around which the elders were gathered and swore an oath to follow God whatever his demands. With the ceremony complete, Joshua demanded the reburial of Joseph's bones that had been brought to Egypt. Um, both the convent stone and um, Joshua's, uh, Joseph's um, second burial site have been described uh, has been found in the archaeological context. Now, for someone that doesn't exist, this is quite a permanent record. Um, and again, although this is um, easily identifiable as the, the convent stone, uh, covenant stone, sorry, um, some archaeologists just ignore this evidence and just overlook it completely. So once again, I'd like to propose that the details of this region would support the biblical account. Right, so um, finally then, I shall just skip forward in time 430 years after the Exodus and look at the time when the scattered tribes of the Israelites were looking for a new king. With the flourishing of neighbourhood kingdoms on their borders, um, and most of this being down to the fact that they were allied with um, Egypt, the Israelites looked for a way to join in this network of alliances. The Israeli Council of Elders realised that in order to become politically visible, they needed a king, and thus they summoned the prophet Samuel. 
Samuel was thus sent out to find a natural leader to become the first king of Israel. In 1012 BC, Samuel was staying with the tribe of Benjamin and was on his way to offer a sacrifice at the town of Ramah when he met a group of men. These men were Lebeah and his servants who were returning from searching for donkeys that had strayed from his father's land. Samuel instantly recognised him as the king he had been searching for and in a secret ceremony anoints Lebeah as prince in waiting. As many of you have probably guessed, Lebeah is the biblical Saul. So why have I been using his legendary name rather than the one given in the Bible? Well, my reasoning for this is that many biblical scholars who dispute the accuracy of the Bible point towards Saul as being the one of their primary examples of the creation of events that never occurred. They argue that the archaeological record has no evidence to support the existence of a king named Saul at any point, and thus they doubt he even existed. I and other scholars who subscribe to the new chronology would argue that the reason they have been unable to find Saul is that they were looking in the wrong time frame. Also, I would suggest um, that they were looking for the wrong person. Scholars have been looking for Saul when in fact he's using his name Lebeah. Although this name Lebeah uh, bears no similarity or relation to the name Saul, um, the name Saul itself is likely to be a legendary one bestowed upon the king upon his death. As I've already shown, we know that Saul was requested by the people, and thus it's really interesting to note that the name Saul actually means asked for by the people. This practice of giving names to famous rulers based on the unique events from their reign is far from uncommon. For example, we know Solomon means peace on account of the unparalleled 40 years of peace during his reign, whilst David means beloved by God on account of the close relationship that he had with the Lord. So, what other evidence is there to equate Lebeo with Saul? Well, under the new chronology, the rise of the Israelite monarchy is contemporary with the Amarna period, and you've probably all heard of the Amarna period due to the famous son Tutankhamun. This has some serious ramifications. Firstly, it means that the Israelite rise to prominence was contemporary with the heretical king Akhenaten, which in turn means we can now use 380 tablets known as the Amarna Letters. The Amarna Letters are a remarkable set of documents which record correspondences between the Egyptian pharaoh and the various cities and city-state rulers on the great king's um, northern empire. Therefore, we find letters to Turkey, Cyprus, Babylonia, Assyria, and finally to Lebea, king of the Israelites. The Amarna letters under the new chronology present some startling evidence to support the biblical narrative. Within the corpus of evidence, we find frequent references to a group of people called the Hebiru. These groups of Hebiru were stateless men who lived outside the normal protection of the city-state and outside of city-state law. The men tended to be mercenaries who were used by a number of local rulers as bodyguards or as a way of protecting their borders. Egyptologists have long recognised that the term Hebiru is a variant of the word Apiru, which in turn can be translated as Hebrew. This has posed conventional chronologists with some serious problems. For example, what are a group of Hebrews doing marauding around a region a century before the Exodus? In order to make the facts fit with their chronology, these historians invented a new group of Israelites, men who left Egypt prior to the Exodus, probably around several generations prior to the Exodus, and actually the later Exodus can be viewed as a second incursion. This, however, seems to me and to my, my peers as wholly unsatisfactory, uh, and especially when the new chronology can offer some really, really interesting finds. Under the new system of dating, this is the exact time frame when we expect to find groups of Hebrews, Hebrews becoming identifiable within the region. These Hebrews are the groups of David's men who broke away from the Israelite court when Saul's rule lost favour with God. Eminent biblical scholars such as Greenberg, Mendelhal and MacArthur all commented on how similar these groups were to the war bands of David. However, because of their rigid beliefs in the conventional chronology, they couldn't have David raging across Palestine in the last decade of the 11th century, whereas now the Amarna letters say that he was doing it in the 14th century. So, whereas these scholars couldn't see that David, these groups were David, we can. 
The Amarna letters can also be used to prove that the general political topography of the Levant region in this period closely corresponds with that described in the second book of Samuel. So, having identified Labea, a so-called king of the Israelites, in the Amarna letters, I'll now briefly demonstrate the evidence and reasons why I feel this is the biblical Saul. To start with, it is interesting to note that Psalm 57, um, King Saul's bodyguard, is described as Lebaim, a word that's unique to the Old Testament. And this translates as the great lion. In 1953, a group of bronze-tipped arrows were excavated in the town of El Kadir near Bethlehem, with some of these arrows containing the inscription, Arrow of the Servant of the Great Lioness. Professor Benjamin Mazar proposes that the men who once owned these arrows had formed a professional unit of archers in the service of Saul. We can therefore see a connection between a king called the Great Lion, a royal bodyguard called the Great Lions, and a unit of archers who were described as servants of the Great Lioness. This interpretation of Saul adds a whole new meaning to Psalms 57.4, where David describes Saul's men as he hides from them in the caves of Engedi. And the passage reads, I lie surrounded by lions, greedy for human prey. Their teeth are spears and arrows, their tongues are sharp as swords. This, therefore, could be a clue to Saul's real identity. When we take a closer look at the lion man, as revealed in the Amarna letters, we discover a number of remarkable similarities between him, him and the biblical Saul. To begin with, the general political situation in Palestine at the time of Lebea is much the same as that described in the, book, uh, in the Bible for Saul, and we also find that Lebea's hometown is captured in a sudden attack by the Philistines. And this is done whilst the Lion King is away fighting on uh, another tribe. This hometown is described as having a sacred site which served to glorify the one true God and which was occupied along with the town. When we compare this to the little we know about Saul's hometown, the parallels are immediately obvious. In 1 Samuel verse 11, we are told that Saul is away fighting the Ammonites when the Philistines seize the opportunity to capture Michmash and Geba. <coughs> While in 1 Samuel 10, we find that close to Saul's house is a sacred site where he will be anointed by Samuel as king of the Israelites. Previous archaeological studies of the region, when examined in light of the new chronology, argue very persuasively for the account of the Bible. With the discovery in the modern town of Jeba, which is now believed to be Geba, of an yet excavated Bronze Age sanctuary, which is remarkably similar in layout to the one described in Samuel, the link becomes even more concrete. Next, we learn from the Amarna letters that Lebea recovers his hometown by force of arms. This he describes as an act of retaliation against an initial aggression. Again, in 1 Samuel 10, we find Saul's actions mirroring those of Lebea's. Saul is also depicted recapturing the lost villages, whilst he sends his son Jonathan to destroy the pillar erected by the Philistines on the sacred site in his hometown. Saul's son Jonathan is to be the crucial element in the next piece of evidence that suggests Saul and Lebea are one and the same. In Lebea's third letter to the Egyptian pharaohs, we learn that his son, who is unfortunately unnamed, is, has been found aiding a group of Hebrew rebels without the knowledge of his father. Here again is a clear parallel with the record of King Saul's reign. In 1 Samuel 20, verses 30 to 31, Saul accuses Jonathan of a secret association with the rebel king David. This close friendship between David and Jonathan is well known, and David is perhaps the clearest example of a Hebrew rebel leader one could ask for. The death of Lebea also prevents, uh, sorry, presents striking evidence to support the hypothesis that he is the biblical Saul. The biblical account of the death of Saul reveals that he took his own life to avoid capture after a crushing defeat at the hands of a Philistine confederacy. In order to avoid being massacred by the Philistine chariots, Saul sensibly withdraws his army to the heights of Gilboa. In spite of the disadvantages, the Philistines continue their pursuit and use their superior numbers to overrun the Israelites. 1 Samuel 31 details the defeat and death of Saul, and although he never directly states it, King David hints in 2 Samuel verses 19 to 27 that the defeats were brought about through treachery. So, were Saul and the Israelites betrayed in some way by their allies? The Bible does not give us any clear answers to this question, but the Imana letters do. Following the death of Lebea at the hands of a confederacy of western city-states, his surviving son sends a letter to one of their friends urging them to wage war on a previous ally, Gina. 
The reasons they give for this request is that they wish to gain, advantage, uh, wish to gain revenge for the role Juno played in the death of their king. So, in what ways could the men of Juno have betrayed Saul so as to be listed as a direct cause of his death? Through a study of the topography of the region, it becomes clear. Saul established his battle line across the north and western face of the heights where the slopes were steepest and where chariots were prevented from ascending. However, the southern slopes behind him were far gentler. This vulnerable spot seems to have been defended by a contingent from Juno. By abandoning their positions to the Philistines, the men of Juno had effectively made it possible for the Israelites to be outflanked, and this gave the Philistines a surprise assault on the rear of Saul's position. With the information from the Amarna letters, it is possible to fully understand and appreciate David's poetic reference to the treacherous fields. The death of Saul was to, be herald, was to herald the beginning of David's rise to power um, and his kingship over the splintered Israelite nation. Finally then, this is also one of the crucial astronomical po anchor points in the new chronology. I once again briefly return to the work of American astrophysicist Wayne Mitchell and his scientific investigations. The results of his investigations in relation to the Amarna period were once more to act as confirmation for the newly revised dates. The dating centres around a small clay tablet that has been unearthed at a royal palace in Ugarit, located on the northern coast of Syria. And we have that there. This is written in cuneiform, so those little triangles and lines are actually a language. The tablet had been baked hard on account of a fire that had destroyed the palace a fire that is also recorded in one of the Amarna letters, and it dates to the 12th year of Akhenaten's reign. The text of this tablet referred to a number of astrological events, the most important of which was a total eclipse of the sun, and this occurred in April-May, just as it was setting. Wayne Mitchell's research indicated that the only total eclipse of the sun that occurred in the lunar month of April or May, was in the, uh, and that was dated to the period 1400 to 1000 BC, is the one which took place on six, at 6.30 on the 9th of May um, on 10.12, with the sunset being at 6.40. This therefore offers startling evidence for the accuracy of the new chronology dates and its revision of the Old Testament chronology, and it brings the Old Testament chronology back in line with that presented in the Bible. The Journal of Ancient Chronology Forum, established a few years ago by David Roll, continues to present ar articles by astrophysicists, historians and archaeologists that add further supporting evidence to this revised timeline. So in conclusion then, what I hope this, this paper has started to show is that there's an urgent need to revise the dating systems of ancient Egypt and Israel. Uh, secondly, that the Bible is, an unrival is unrivaled as a source of evidence for the study of Near Eastern history. And thirdly, that the Bible remains accurate even when recording the smallest and most insignificant of details. Uh, and that's my talk.